Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak your word for your people today. And may we hear and then live in light of the reality of the word of God every minute, every hour, every day for 2024 and beyond. And we pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. This is the keynote address for 2024. And the title is Destined for Glory. Now, there are a few of you who have heard this or a version of this before, but in a different language. So you will hear it today in English for the first time. We are all together in the same place today, but tomorrow is going to be different. Many came for yesterday's events, but tomorrow they will go back to far-flung places or some other day they will go back. Oklahoma, Texas, Ohio, Florida, Canada, England, and so on. The point is that our present location does not determine our final destination. In determining our destination, it is much more important to look at the direction that we are traveling rather than our location today. You can be very close to God today. You can be in the presence of God even today in his church. But if you are moving the wrong way, you will never reach him. Every day you will only get farther and farther away. So where we are headed and the direction we are headed in is much more important than where we are and much more important than where we have been in the past. It is true in the world. It is true in the church. And so my question for you in 2024 is, where are you going? How are you getting there? How careful are you to follow the directions? This is what we will consider this morning. Of course, we would all say we want to go to glory with God forever. But there is a way to go there. There is one way, the way of faith in Jesus Christ. And our location in the church does not mean that we are on that way. So we must wake up, rise up, and make sure that we do not fall asleep or get lost along the way. Point number one, what is your life? As people who have trusted in Jesus Christ, our lives do not belong to us. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19, you are not your own. Romans 14, 8, we belong to the Lord. So we do not belong to ourselves. We are not sovereign over ourselves. We are not autonomous beings. The negative, you do not belong to yourself. The positive, you belong to the Lord. Why do we belong to him? Well, it is true that he made us, Psalm 139, 13 says so, but that's not really the reason we as God's people belong to the Lord. In fact, that's true of everyone and everything that has ever existed. God made it, and so he owns it. So saying, I belong to God because he made me, is the same boast that a blade of grass or an insect can make. I am made by God. But as Christians, as believers, as those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, we belong to him for another reason, because he bought us with his own blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. We were bought with a price. We own the things that we buy in this world, and we have a right to do with them whatever we want. My possessions have no rights. My car cannot tell me what it wants me to do or how I am to use it. It has no will. It has no rights. It has no preferences. The car simply exists for my purposes and my convenience. I can drive it where I want. I can drive it, at least within the limits of the law, how I want. I can give it away. I can sell it. I can keep it forever, I can let it rust, or I can maintain it. It belongs to me, I have total control over what I do with it. Well, it is the same for us vis-a-vis -vis God. God bought us with a price, and a huge price. And so he owns us, and we are his to, for him to do with what he pleases. He bought us with a huge price, not money, not work, 
Not anything so cheap as that. No, we were bought with an immeasurable price, an infinite price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Before he bought us, we were in big, big trouble. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. Ephesians 2, 1. We were enemies of God. Philippians 3.18 and Romans 5.10. We sinned against God, Romans 3.23. We deserved God's eternal wrath and we deserved eternal death, Romans 6.23. We owed an infinite debt to God which we could never repay. And we were destined for hell forever, torment, agony, no way out. Jesus described it in Luke 16. In fact, we were slaves, not to Christ, but to sin. We were slaves to a cruel master, Romans 6, verse 20. And we were destined for a life of eternal misery. But then Jesus, mighty Jesus, glorious Jesus, God became man and bought us with his precious blood. He paid the whole price for us, the price that we could not pay to redeem us, 1 Corinthians 5, 21, he who had no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus bought us from slavery to sin and he made us free to be slaves to God. Now he did not buy us to set us free in the sense we might use that term, in the sense of autonomy. He did not buy us to make us autonomous. He did not sacrifice himself so that we could just go about doing our thing. In fact, we were already doing our thing when he freed us. Our thing was to make ourselves slaves to sin and slaves to the devil. So we were already doing our own thing. That's what we chose with our so-called freedom. And it is what we will always choose in our nature as human beings until we are born again by the Holy Spirit and given a new nature, a new heart, and a new spirit. Up until then, we will always choose slavery to sin. Every person, everywhere, no matter how good or how bad. Jesus set us free for a much greater purpose than meaningless autonomy. He set us free to be his slaves. He set us free from sin to be his servants. He set us free from the devil to belong to him, Jesus Christ, to live for him, Jesus Christ. Now, we do not like the word slavery in this culture. It's a bad word. There's a reason we don't like it. But it is all over the Bible. Romans 1, 1, Paulus, doulos, Paul, a slave. Philippians 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, doulos, Christos, slaves of Christ. Our sensitive modern Bibles try to change that word into something a little more palatable for us, servants. But the word in most places in the scripture is slave, slave, slave. So get it through your head, we are slaves. Slaves, though, to Jesus Christ. Slavery to Jesus Christ is the maximum freedom, the maximum joy, the maximum peace, and the maximum purpose we can have in this life. It is the maximum freedom anyone ever can have. It is, in fact, a return to the order of the Garden of Eden, to the very good, when everything was very good. Man under God. That was the creation order. Man living with God, that was the creation order. Man living for God's purpose, that was the creation order. See, slavery to Christ in this life is a preview of heaven. It's a, it's a partial experience of what those who are in glory now are experience. Perfect communion with Christ, perfect submission to his will, no battle of I want but I should, all one way to serve God and to glorify God. Everyone living according to God's will and for God's purposes all the time, everyone praising God, everyone crying glory to God, that will be our life in eternal heaven and that can be in part our life as Christians now. You see, in heaven, think about what you'll be doing in heaven. Sometimes you see the cartoon and people are playing the harp or something like that. I hope I don't have to do that. (laughs) 
but some people have an idea it will be me fulfilling my indulgences, my desires for eternity. No, no. In heaven, we will not be pursuing our purposes forever. We will be fulfilling our purpose forever by living for God and for his glory forever. We must have this view of our life. It is a different view than the rest of the world holds. It is not my life to do with what I please. I laugh every time I hear my body, my choice, or something like that. I think, nope, not yours. You didn't make it, you don't sustain it, and you don't own it. We all belong to God, more so us who were bought by his blood. So it is not my life to do with what I please. My life belongs to God who made me, who bought me, and who owns me. My life belongs to God to use me as he pleases. My life belongs to God who loves me and who rescued me and who redeemed me at the highest possible cost. The precious blood of Jesus, his beloved son, very God himself. And because of this, because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that redeemed me from sin, because of this, I will remember that every day I live for God. I will remember every day to live in thanksgiving to God who bought me. I am not sorry to be the slave of God. I am happy to be the slave of God. I am so glad, so happy in Jesus, so overwhelmed with the joy of the Lord that I will obey him in all things for his glory forever. I will offer myself as a living sacrifice, a daily sacrifice to God, Romans 12, verse 1. I am so happy, so thankful for what God has done for me that I will testify about him and his glory forever. It will come out of me without me even being able to stop myself from testifying about God because I am so happy what he did for me and I want to be happy for you in the same way. I am so thankful to God that I will build his church for his present and future glory. For that is his great project on this earth, to build his church. And in the end, I will go to him in glory forever, to cry glory forever, to fully glorify him and fully enjoy him forever. In other words, to perfectly fulfill my chief purpose, the reason for which I exist, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We can do it now. We can do it in part now. But we can do it in full, in glory forever. And in fact, others are there doing it now. Think about that life. 100% glory to God all the time. How fulfilling that is. Glory, glory, glory all the time. That is life in Christ. And that is my life in Christ, and that can be your life in Christ. Life is not chasing after little green pieces of paper or shiny rocks or gold coins. It is pursuing a more valuable, most valuable object, the glory of God. It is not building a big house so I can show it off to everyone. It is building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Your big house is going to burn down, maybe in this life, maybe in the end of time, but it will burn down. But his building, the church, will never be destroyed. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Life is not saving up a huge 401k retirement to pass on your tax problem to the future generation. It is storing up treasure in heaven. Life is not about worshiping my children, but rather worshiping the true and living God. Life is not living by my desires or my feelings. It is living by the very word of God. And it is a great and glorious life to live for God. It is a great and glorious life to be a slave of God. Now, slaves in this world are miserable. Earthly slavery that we have seen, it exists today, but that we have seen in our history is a great moral evil. It's a moral evil just just on the grounds of owning another person, but it's worse in its execution. Slaves are treated terribly. They are beaten and abused. They are starved. They live in misery. misery. They are treated in terrible ways and used as property. 
they are left for dead or they are sold for money. That's true. That, that's, that's another reason why slavery is terrible. But I want to tell you, it's true for slaves in this world. And it's true, truer even, for slaves to sin, for slaves to Satan. You see, it is a terrible and despotic slavery. But there is a different slavery, a good slavery, a joyous slavery, and a glorious slavery, slavery to the good shepherd who takes care of his sheep. Slavery to the one whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. Slavery to the one who loves the miserable slaves, who cares for them and who binds up their wounds. Slavery to the one who always does good to his slaves and who works all things for the good of his slaves. Romans 8, 28. Slavery to the one who calls us not slaves, but beloved sons and daughters. Slavery to the one who regards us as jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. Slavery to the good master, to the best master, to the loving master. Slavery to the one who made us, who made us like him in his image and likeness. Think of what a great honor it is to be made in the image and likeness of God. It's not for everybody. The dog is not made in the image and likeness of God. The cat is not made in the image of likeness of God. Even stately beings like a lion or something is not made in the image and likeness of God. You, however, are made in the image and likeness of God. It is a great honor. Slavery to the one who made us for the purpose of fellowship with him, to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. To enjoy him forever means fellowship. Slavery to the one who made us for the express purpose to know and love him. Slavery to the one who made us to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. Slavery to the master who lays down his life for the slave. Slavery to the master who redeemed us to return us to that good purpose for which he made us after we threw it all away. Slavery to that master who is coming again with glory to take us to glory forever. So don't be ashamed to be a slave. I stand here to say I am a slave, a glorious slave, a happy slave of Jesus, the good shepherd. That is my life, and that can be your life. It is your life if you are in Christ. But if you are not, it can be your life. It can be your life in Christ today, a life of glorious slavery to the master. Don't go your own way. We already tried it. We have a book that describes it, Genesis 3 and beyond. People went their own way, and what is the result? Mess, mess, mess. Look around at all the mess you see in the world and trace it back to one day of rebellion against God, of going your own way. Man said, I will do my own thing. I will become like God, apart from God, free from his government. Ah, but free from his government, first of all, doesn't exist. But the attempt to be free from his government is also an attempt to be free from his care, from his protection, from his mercy. It did not work then in the garden. It has not worked since, and it will not work now. It cannot work. The only result of being outside of God, so-called free from God, is slavery to the devil and to sin and to misery forever. In his act of rebellion, Adam plunged the whole world, you and me too, into sin and slavery. And we cannot get out, having been brought into that by rebellion, we cannot get out with more rebellion. The first thing you do when you're in a deep hole is stop digging. You cannot get, dig, dig your way into the hole, you cannot dig your way out of the hole. So do, stop rebelling. More rebellion is not the answer. You will just get in deeper and harder and worse. But in Jesus Christ, we were redeemed. We were bought back from slavery to sin, and we are now free. 
It is for freedom that Christ set us free, Galatians 5, 1. We have freedom in Christ Jesus every day, even today, now, Galatians 2, 4. It's not for later. There's a greater freedom that will come later, but there's a freedom for now, a freedom we have in Christ now, a freedom to love God now, to live for God now, and to glorify God now, and free eventually to glorify him forever in glory. That is glorious freedom. We are not mere property. We are not of low value and low regard and easily discarded. Oh, we are property, all right, but we are highly regarded, highly valued in the sight of the one place where it matters, in the sight of God. Bought at the maximum price, called his treasured possession, his segula, Exodus 19.6. In fact, later called in Deuteronomy 4.20, God's inheritance. God's portion, which he chose for himself. Think about those terms. We are high value people because God has set upon us a high value. So let us get rid of the idea, I live for me. Let us get rid of the idea so common in the modern church, God exists to give me what I want, the Coke machine idea. That is the American idea. It is the most of the world idea, thanks to our great ability to export bad ideas. Uh, the idea is I live for my own happiness and for my own agenda. That is low value, low value way to live. High value is to live as God says we are, his treasured possession, his love, his own, his sons, and his daughter. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us be what we are, God's treasured possessions. Let us live for God's agenda and God's purpose, for God's glory and to bring God happiness. I don't know how we can do it, but it says the Lord rejoices over us. Let us live for God's will, and we will find that living for God's will fulfills me. Living for God's will makes me happy. Now, it's not the principal motivation. I'm not seeking my own happiness directly. I am seeking God's glory. I am seeking God's will. But in that, I experience maximum happiness, maximum fulfillment. So let us do that. Let us seek him and his glory first. Seek first the kingdom of God rather than my illusory happiness. My happiness is simply a byproduct of living for God. We must change how we think about our life. What is your life? That's the question. We must change how we think about it. We must be countercultural. We must become theocentric, God-centric, God at the center. We must commit ourselves to live for God and God only. What is your life? Live for God. Point number two, how do I do it? How do I live life for the glory of God? Most of us here will agree I must live for God. Not everybody, but most of you. But how do I do it sometimes? It can be hard to know how do I do it in this situation. And it can be hard sometimes to do it even when I know what to do. That old sin nature still lives in me to bother me. Enemies are still around us, the world, the flesh, the devil, and false brothers. Or we simply grow weary and forget. So how do we do it? I will give you a number of points. First, we must confess Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the sine qua non, the without which not. You don't do this, none of the other steps will do anything for you. You simply cannot live for God and yet call him a liar by saying Jesus is not my Lord. He says Jesus is Lord. It is impossible to say no to that and then to live for God. He said Jesus is Lord. He said Jesus is the only way to be saved. He says Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And we must say amen to that by trusting in Jesus alone. We cannot look to false gods. 
We cannot imagine that I can be good enough in my own for God. We cannot trust in a false church to save me, or for that matter, even a true church to save me. We cannot trust in anything except Jesus alone. I must trust in Jesus alone, and the reason is God says so. God commands it. God demands it. It's not even that it's for my good, although it certainly is. It is because God says so authoritatively. Moreover, God receives great glory in saving sinners like us. It is the most glory we can bring to God is when we confess Jesus Lord. It shows his mercy, it shows his love, and it shows his goodness to us. We're told in the Holy Scriptures that when we confess Jesus Lord, the whole heavenly host rejoices. The whole heavenly host cries glory. There is rejoicing in heaven, Luke 15, verse 7. Now what greater glory can we bring to God than an act on this earth which causes the heavens to rejoice? It doesn't even make sense if you think about it. How can I do something? What we do down here seems so low and so base. And yet there is an act we can do by God's grace here on this earth, which causes great uh, uh, wall-shaking rejoicing in heaven. Think about it. And what is that act to say? Jesus, Lord, to commit our lives to Jesus Christ. So if you have not confessed Christ as Lord, you can bring great glory to God today. If you are sitting there thinking, well, I am a sinner. What can I do for God? I am not saved. What can I do for God? I tell you, you have an opportunity to bring more glory to God than I can bring to God. You can cause the heavens and the earth to rejoice and to cry out, glory, glory, glory. So confess Jesus Christ as Lord and hear that heavenly host cry out glory and hear them shake the foundations of the heavens and the very creations as they praise God for his mercy to you. If you have not done that and if you will not do that, you can do nothing else for God. You can only bring him glory in a different way, in a much less pleasant way. You can bring him glory through his justice, as he judges judges you in justice and condemns you to eternal hell. Now, you can bring God glory as a demonstration of his mercy and be saved and live in glory forever, or you can bring God glory by a demonstration of his justice that leaves you in hell forever. If you do not know the answer to that question, I cannot help you. Second, second way to live for God. We must confess Jesus is Lord. This is the entry Uh, uh, into how we can glorify God. Second, we must obey God. We cannot bring glory to God while living in rebellion to his commands. It is impossible. In Luke 9, 23, the Lord Jesus says, we must each deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Follow where he leads and follow how he leads. This is what the Lord Jesus did perfectly for his entire life. John 17, 4, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus brought glory to God by his obedience to God. Jesus obeyed God, his heavenly father, and he obeyed God uh, uh, by obeying his earthly parents, Luke 2, 51. Why did he obey them? He's superior to them in every way. Why did he obey them? Because that is what his heavenly father said to do. Why did he get baptized? He didn't need to have his sins uh, washed away symbolically or otherwise. He said, it is proper to do to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, God told me to do it and I'm going to do it. That's what Jesus did. That's what we must do. Obey God in whatever he commands, no matter how, how hard it may seem to do. Honor your father and mother and obey them because God says, Ephesians 6, verse 1. Honor the boss at work and obey him because God says, Ephesians 6, 4. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. God says, Hebrews 13, 17. Be the head in your home, husbands. God said, 2 Corinthians eleven three. 3. Oh, it's very difficult to be the head in my home. No kidding. But God will help you to do it. And beyond that, God commanded you to do it. So you must do it. Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. It's hard to do. You can do it. God will help you. 
and God says that you must. See, it doesn't matter. The other, culture says something else. Do something else. It does not matter what your mother tells you to do or what your girlfriends tell you to do or what the television or the internet tells you to do. God says, Ephesians 5, 22, and God will bless your obedience and curse your disobedience to his command. And don't worry, I have said it before, but I'll say it again. Don't worry, you look over at your husband side-eyed and think he's kind of shaky and he might make a few mistakes. Yeah, he's going to make a few mistakes. Everything will be all right. God will take care of you if you obey God's command to submit to your husband. And for all of us, we must bring all things under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And there is peace and there is blessing in doing it for us. But more importantly, there is glory to God in doing so. Third way, be very careful. Obeying God is not something we can do in a loose way. You either obey God or you don't obey God. It's a binary thing. Obey him or don't. We must do exactly what he commands. John 14, 31, Jesus said, I always do exactly what the Father commands. Now, we recognize we're sinners. We're imperfect. We're going to fall short. We understand that that's going to happen. But this should be our goal and our effort and the direction of our life is to obey God and to attempt it to do it exactly. God himself warns us to be careful in our obedience to him. Deuteronomy 12, 28, Hebrews 2, verse 1, pay careful attention. This means we must read our Bibles and study them closely. God is speaking to us in his word. This is the principal way that we know the will of God is in his objective written word. We must pay close attention. Think about it as we read it and think about it later throughout the day. It's not rushed through or worse, listen to it on audio recording while I go about the rest of my day. It's not how you would do something important. We must listen carefully when we read the word. We must listen carefully when the word is preached and taught. We heard yesterday when the pastor is faithfully expositing the word, God is speaking. When my mother or father is faithfully speaking the word in the home and devotions, God is speaking. Don't go to sleep when the word is preached. Don't turn off your brain. Don't look for entertainment. Engage your brain. It's, a, it's an important task that you are doing. Engage your brain. To be careful, we must also be careful to pray. The word of God is the principal means by which God gives us his will, but it's not the only means. We must pray so that we can hear God speaking to us. See, we speak to God and he speaks to us in prayer. But you must ask and keep on asking and then you must do the very difficult task of shut up and listen to what God is saying. I come with a list of things for God to do as though he needed me to give him the agenda for the day. But we have to take time to listen to what the still small voice is telling us to do. We must listen, we must go to God and speak to God in prayer. We must listen to God, but then we must do it. We must obey God as he speaks to us, whether in the word that we read or in our prayer time or through the indwelling Holy Spirit who we heard is the resident boss. God lives in us to speak to us, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. And so we must live in a way that we know and hear his voice, that we can pick it out in the crowd. We must live holy lives so that we are not quenching, quieting down the voice of the Spirit in us, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. We must live quietly, not drowning out the voice of God with worldliness. And we must speak to him regularly so that we can pick out his voice. You have seen it sometimes with uh, uh, mothers or fathers out here. There are children running around all over the place. It's chaos out there after the service. And yet you hear somebody cry, and the mother knows the voice. The father knows the voice. You can pick it out of the herd of children out there making all kinds of noise. Do the same with the Holy Spirit. Get familiar with the voice of the Holy Spirit so you can discern what spirit is speaking to me. I know the voice of God because I have talked to him lots of times. Therefore, when he speaks, I can do it. Remember the boy Samuel, when he was a young kid, when he first heard the voice of God, he didn't know. God was speaking, but he didn't know who is speaking to me. Later in life, he was familiar with God. He knew when God was speaking to him and not. 
The Holy Spirit is our biggest helper to know and to do the will of God. Let's use it. Let's uh, uh, cultivate that relationship with the Holy Spirit so we can know. To be very careful to obey, last sub point here is that we must rely on God. He will make us able when we are weak. Hebrews 13, 20 tells us, the Lord Jesus will equip you with everything good for doing his will. We are not equipped in our, on our own. And even when we are equipped, we become unequipped over time. But God will equip us and keep equipping us. This is not a call to persevere in your own strength. Yes, make the maximum effort, but always rely on God to keep filling the gas tank with the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, God is for us and he wants us to succeed. Second Chronicles 15, 2, the Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, you will be found by him. He's not trying to make it difficult. Rely on the Lord and he will make you able to obey him. Rely on yourself. You will get at best mixed results. Rely on God and recognize that, yes, I will sin from time to time, but I will repent in reliance on God and get up and do the next right thing. Always making sure that my motive is not myself, but to glorify God. Fifth way to live for God, have relationship with God. God is glorified when he shows his love to us his love to us in salvation, his love to us in blessing. This whole week was blessing after blessing after blessing, right down to the weather. God is glorified in his loving relationship with us. This happens to me sometimes. I like to talk to little kids. They're nice people. They're easy to talk to, and they are funny. And you will see that when a big person leans down to little kids, you see love demonstrated for that little kid. Well, think how much more God's love is demonstrated in his much bigger leaning down to our much lower. Do not hide from God in fear. There's a right fear of God, but it's not abject terror. It should not cause us to hide. It is reverence. It is loving relationship. God invites us to draw near to him. So go to God and relate to God and share life with God. Fellowship with God. Think about the garden. Fellowship like Adam did in the garden with God, walking in the cool of the day without shame and without fear. Do it alone. Do it with your family. Do it corporately in the church. Don't forget, yeah, God is mighty and awesome, but God loves you. God invites you into relationship with him. Glory in that truth. See, the devil will come and say, you need more fear of God. In fact, so much fear of God, you have to run away from God. That's a lie. That's a perversion of the proper fear of God. That same God who, who we are to fear in reverence, we are also to relate to in love. Next, give God first place in your life. How to live for God. Priority shows what is important. Some people came here internationally on two days notice yesterday. Some canceled their vacations or cut short their out of town trips. That shows priority. This was important to me. Others chose not to come or go ahead with their own planned travel. It's to see it's simply a matter of priority. It is true in big matters and it is true in small. And you will notice most of the time that if I am talking to you and my wife comes over to interrupt, I will turn my attention to her and I will tell you why. I like you, but I like her more than I like you. <laughs> you are important, but she is more important to me. Or if I am tired after a long day of work, I will play cards with my daughter because she is more important to me than my rest most of the time. So you have to choose one or the other. Am I going to talk to you or am I going to talk to her? Am I going to go to bed or am I going to get whipped in a card game? You have to choose. You choose, most of the time, relationship. As God's chosen people bought by the blood of Jesus, we must give God first place in our hearts and we must demonstrate that priority in our heart by our actions. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. 
See, God must come before anything else. Even my wife and my children and my job and my father and my mother, indeed, even my own life. Luke 14, 26. We can say whatever we want to say. We say all kinds of things. But we see the true measure of our heart by what we do. Do I give God first place in my heart by reading my Bible every day, by praying every day? Or do I give myself and my comforts first place in my life by sleeping in, rushing off to go to work or to run the errands or to do whatever I have to do in this life? Oh, I will get up very early in the morning. I hate to get up in the morning, but I will get up very early in the morning to make the airplane. Will I get up very early in the morning to be with God? Show that God is first by stopping what you are doing and doing what he wants. In other words, doing what God commands instead of what I believe that I need. Do I put God, do I show that God has first place in my life by making corporate worship in his church a priority? He is the one who said, do not give up the habit of meeting together. I want to come and I want to hear from God. I want to worship God in his church. I want to worship with God's people. See, things happen. An important thing happened yesterday, and we did it together. And that togetherness is going to bind us together closer and for a long, long time. It cannot be recreated. We will not do that again. There's a certain bonding in that. That's true every time we come to church, every time we encounter the living God. Now, things happen. We are going to miss. We are going to be sick. We are going to have things that that from time to time must be done. But my point is, make your top priority the worship and service of God, especially in his church where he put me and told me to go, Hebrews 10, 25. See, I'm not talking about uh, don't ever miss church. That's not the point. But many people will skip church for foolish reasons, for sports, for unnecessary vacation, or to quote unquote rest. Many people will move away for two more dollars. Many people will change churches, not in this church, but will change churches for silly reasons like music or the schedule of the time when they meet. If this describes you, I counsel you, stop it. Change your priorities. Give God first place in your life. Do I seek God first? By giving to God, by paying to God tithe and giving to God offering. God commands us to support his great project, to build his church. Malachi 3, 10, we heard it read, bring the whole tithe. 1 Timothy 5, 8, do not muzzle the ox while he's treading out the grain. And people here do that. So this is not, we don't beg for money. But the point is, some people will say one thing, but they will not let go of their two dollars. They will say there is no tithe in the New Testament. They are wrong, but that's okay. I said this in Florida. If you want to say there's no tithe in the New Testament, I will say, okay, you are free to follow their example and sell everything you have and give it to the church. We will not refuse you that grace. Acts 2.42 and 4.32-34. My point is this. What you do with your money is a reflection of your priority. It's in limited supply. It's just like what you do with your time is a reflection of your priority because it's in limited supply. If you, have, if you pay $1,000 a month for your car, but say, oh, I do not have any money for God, then you can say whatever you want. You value the car more than you value God. I like numbers. Numbers are great because numbers stare you in the face and they are easy to measure. Do I give to God my first or do I give to God my last? Do I give to God my best like Abel or my leftovers that I don't really want like Cain? Fear comes to all of us, especially about money and things like that. But I will give you this counsel. Trust God. Do to him as he says. He will not put you to shame. The children of the king of kings and lord of lords do not go about starving and in rags. Trust God by your obedience and he will provide for you abundantly. Malachi 3.10. It was pastor's experience. It is my experience. It is probably most of your experiences. And if it's not, it can be your experience. Commit 
to seeking God first in everything. I use these as examples, but we can use anything. Anything can become an idol in our life that, that moves above God. These are just common examples. But my point is, commit to seeking God first in everything. Where I live, how I use my time and my money. Put God above my children. If you think that's hard to do, remember Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. Put God above my husband or my wife even, as David did. Put God above my feelings or my way of thinking, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. If you do this, if you put God first, he will never, ever disappoint you. Seek first the kingdom of God is not the end of the verse. And all these things will be added unto you. God works all things for your good if you are his. And I will tell you, I ripped this off from Pastor Geddes. If God does not give you what you desired, then he is giving you something even better. God will never give you something you don't like. It will simply be better. So put God first and be prepared to be amazed. Next, give God all the glory. When good things happen to you, make sure that you give him all the glory. This can be hard to do. We like to get a little bit of the glory. But everything we have is from God, and so all glory belongs to him. And so we say, as it is written behind me, soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. Give him the glory by praising him in the church. Look at what God did for me. Look at what a mighty God we serve. Give him the glory by testifying out in the world. There is a God, and here is who he is. Matthew 28, 18, Great Commission. Tell them all about Jesus. Tell them what Jesus did for you and tell them what Jesus can do for them. It may, it will cost you. Mockery, friendships, relationships might cost you your job or your freedom or your life even in some places. At the very minimum, it will make you uncomfortable. But put God first by overcoming all of that. And remember, they did it to Jesus too. Mockery, oppression by friends and family, arrested and beaten and killed. Killed for you, killed for us. <clears throat> and yet he obeyed God despite his very real fear. Not my will, but thine be done. We must do as Jesus did, putting the Father's will first. So serve God for his glory with your whole life. It is our purpose. It is our fulfillment and joy. It is our glory to do so. Last point, remember. Life is long. At least it seems long to us. And life is busy. We forget things. We lose track. We begin to take things for granted. So it's important that we stop and focus and refocus and take time to remember it helps us to keep on going or to set things right that may have gotten out of order. It's part of the reason we stop to celebrate holidays, anniversaries, birthdays, and so on. It's a time to stop and remember this person, this thing is important to me. We must remember the past. Remember what God has already done for us. Became man, humiliation, lived a perfect life of obedience for us set his face like flint and went to his death for us, knowing that it would be terrible on that cross, but for us, knowing the spiritual agony of God's full wrath that was about to come on him for us, but he went anyways. The full wrath of God taken for us and drunk to the last drop until he could say, te telestai, it is finished, it is completed, it is fulfilled. And then he died, all for the glory of God and all to our eternal benefit. Remember the past, that he gave us life, physical life, that he gave us eternal life. He sent someone to the gospel with us. He moved in us by his Holy Spirit as that gospel was spoken and saved us. He gave us food and clothing and homes and families and a church. He gave us the gift of pastors and teachers, Ephesians 4, 11. He gave us kingdom work. It's a great honor to be assigned to God's construction project, building his church. He did all that for us. Stop and remember, Pastor preached a sermon years ago, count your blessings. Take time to stop and remember what God has done for us in the past. But also we must remember in the present what God is doing for us now, what God has for us 
to do now. He did things in the past, but he is not done. See, you are still alive, and so he still has something for you to do. I heard pastor tell somebody one time, you can retire from work, but don't retire from life. It will be different for each of us what God has for us to do now. It may be different from what he had for us to do in the past. It may be different from what he will have for us to do in the future. So it'll be different. A pastor must study and preach and counsel and bear the burdens. A student must go to work and to school. A husband must lead the family and rule in the home. A wife must submit to that husband in the Lord. We must all honor and obey the boss, obey the government within its proper sphere, Romans 13, 1. We must all build the church through evangelism and service and sanctification. We must all pray for one another, love one another, and serve one another. We must all read our Bibles and seek counsel and pray and listen to what God the Holy Spirit is telling me to do this way and not that way today. You say I live for God yesterday. I say good. You say I will live for God tomorrow. I say good. But stop and remember to live for him today as well to enjoy him today as well, to fellowship with him today as well, and to speak to him today, and to hear from him today, and to dwell with God today. I must seek first the kingdom of God today. It's in every little act that I do. It's not a, it's not a general narrative. It's every action I seek the will and the, and the kingdom of God. It does not matter if you are 17 or 47 or 87. Today is the day to live for God. Put him first. Remember that it is all about God today and not about me. That you must live quorum Deo before the face of God today. That you must live a holy life today and please God today. Now it's true, God will bless you if you do so. But again, that's not my purpose. I am seeking the glory of God today. And the blessing will come as a fringe benefit. Remember your God every day throughout the day, living for him, obeying him, glorifying him. And when the conflict comes, when I have to choose this or God, I choose God. When I have to choose Sleeping in and skipping my devotions or God, I choose God. When I have to choose this girl or this boy or this sin over against God, I choose God. I will stay on the straight and narrow path that leads to life. Not getting drawn off on the side path is easier to go on most of the time, but leads you to destruction. Remember the past, remember the present, and remember the future. I must not get stuck always looking at the ground by my feet in front of me. I must look up to God. I must fix my eyes on Jesus, Hebrews 12, verse 2. This is where I am, and this is what I must do for God today. But I must remember, this is not where I am going to be. I am headed somewhere. This is not my home. This is not my final destination. I am going in a direction. I am going to God. I am going to heaven. I am destined for glory. This world is not my home or my purpose. It is just a stop on the way. My home is with God. My home is with Jesus. My home is with all the assembled saints in glory forever. So I must stop from time to time and think about that place where I am going. I am going to heaven I must stop and think about it from time to time. It will help me when I hit a rocky patch on that straight and narrow path. It will help me to persevere in trials when I get tired. It will help me to keep on going, and it will help me not to drift away or to settle for less, which is ultimately the refuse of this earth. I must remember that my destiny is eternal glory, and that will help me not to make a bad trade, a little passing earthly glory, a little stuff, a little stuff that is not worth much and certainly not worth the eternal glory of life with God. I must stop and remember the future and that it is a guaranteed future. Jesus will come and take me there or I will go to him through the doorway of death. 
But either way, I will end up in one place if I am in Christ. Glory. A glory so glorious that it cannot be fully described. Don't look away from that glory. Look up to that glory. Think about that glory. Delight in that glory. Meditate on it and thinking about it. It's coming and it's coming soon. What will we do in this glory? Well, I burned all these points yesterday, but I'll make them again anyway. What will we do in this glory? I will see God face to face in this glory. I will see his glorious throne. I will hear his majestic voice and I will hear the living creatures crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. It's not what they're going to do sometime in the future. They're doing it now. I can hear the echoes of it now. I will see the elders casting down their crowns and they will cry, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. I will see the lamb and I will sing the new song, you are worthy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. I will cry out to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. I will see his final triumph over all things. Every tear wiped away, we will see it. I will see the angels and the scrolls and the trumpets and the dragon and the beast cast down forever. And I will see... I will see the risen Lord on the white horse, King of kings and Lord of lords. It's not a story in the book. You're going to see it. I will see the river of life flowing ever deeper. And listen to it from our text this morning, Revelation 19. This is what we are going to experience. Think about it. Think about it now as I read it, but think about it tomorrow. And think about it the next day and every day. This is what it will be. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated at the throne, and they cried, Amen, hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants who fear him, both small and great. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Saints of God, saints of Grace Valley Christian Center, that is our future. Think about your future. And it is not the distant future. It is the forever future, but it is imminent. It is coming soon. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. With joy, we welcome his returning. Our salvation is not far off. It is, we are told in the scriptures, it is nearer now than it was before. How long, sovereign Lord? How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true? How long, they cry out, and the answer comes back, not long. Not much longer. Just a little while longer. Until God's great harvest is complete until the last of his living stones is mortared into his great building project, his church, until the trumpet shall sound and the Lord shall return and the endless age of endless glory with God shall be here forever. Don't forget who we are. By God's grace, we are God's people, chosen of the Lord. Don't forget what we are here to do in 2024. Live for him, glorify him, and enjoy him forever. And don't forget where we are going, whether in 2024 or beyond, destined for glory. So remember it, look forward to it. Do your part to speed its coming and invite others to come along with us. Live for God and for his glory today and tomorrow. Make yourself ready, bride. Make yourself ready for the wedding supper of the lamb that is coming. And live for God, for his glory today and tomorrow. And you will be prepared for your glorious destiny. Amen.